Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our expert roundtable discussion today on the topic of competence to stand trial, sponsored by the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke Law School. I'm Jeff Swanson, a faculty affiliate with the Wilson Center's Behavioral Health Corps and a professor in the psychiatry department in the School of Medicine here at Duke. Our topic today is people who have a serious and disabling mental illness and are accused of a criminal offense, but there's a concern at some point about whether that a defendant is mentally competent, whether they have a, a, the legally sufficient capacity to understand what they're facing and to participate and proceed with criminal adjudication. Another term for this that you hear sometimes is fitness to stand trial. So there's a lot of questions about this and we've assembled a wonderful panel of experts to, to try to answer some of these questions. So how, how is it determined that a person is mentally competent to face criminal charges? And, what does that mean as a legal status as a, and from a clinical functional point of view? And if a defendant's not competent, what happens then? Do they go into limbo where they're not triable in a criminal court, but they also can't be um, released into the community? Uh, what does the process of restoration to competence look like today in various jurisdictions from a, from a state policy and practice point of view? Do some people get diverted from the whole process? And on what basis is that fair? What are the pathways to community reentry? And what's the effect of a competence to stand trial in the larger public mental health system versus the criminal legal system? What purpose does it serve? What challenges does it pose for the actors in each of these systems? And are these systems working? Some evidence suggests that it's in a, some kind of a crisis. And if so, how should that be fixed? And that's some of what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm so excited uh, to, to get into this discussion with some of our nation's top experts on this topic, also, all of whom are, are, are my friends as well. And uh, so it's, it's gonna be a wonderful event. Um, and actually what's interesting too is that our panelists include uh, the current or past directors of state forensic programs in four different states, Michigan, Maryland, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. So I'm going to introduce each of them, and um, then each one will take about five or so minutes uh, to just give us their experience and perspective and, and wisdom on this topic, and then we'll go from there and have a robust discussion amongst ourselves, the, the panelists, try to wrap up in about an hour or so, and then we'll uh, take questions uh, from you all in the chat, and uh, we, we can go on for a while at that point. I think we're a little flexible on when we're going to end. Um, so uh, let, let's, let's start with, uh, with Larry Fitch, uh, Esquire. And Larry is a distinguished attorney. He's nationally recognized authority on mental disability in the law. He teaches courses on that topic at the University of Maryland uh, Cary Law School and in the Forensic Psychiatry Fellowship Program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Larry started his career as a research attorney with the Institute on Mental Disability and the Law at the National Center for State Courts. And then he joined the faculty of the University of Virginia Law School, where he directed the Forensic Evaluation Training and Research Center at the university's Institute of Law, Psychiatry, and Public Policy. And then for two decades, Larry uh, served, uh, I think it's about two decades, as the Director of Forensic Services for Maryland's uh, Mental Hygiene Administration. So he's just a wonderful authority on this. And then we'll hear from Dr. Rena Kapoor. Uh, Rena is a forensic psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry at Yale. Uh, in the School of Medicine there. She's the Associate Program Director for the Yale Forensic Psychiatry Fellowship, uh, teaching and supervising fellows in what is the country's largest training program for forensic psychiatrists. Her clinical work and scholarship focuses on the intersection of mental illness, violence, and the criminal justice system, and she has worked in a whole variety of treatment settings, including prisons and jails and forensic hospitals in the community. And of special relevance to our topic today, Rena is the person responsible uh, in the state of Connecticut for that state's program of competency restoration services. So she's a real uh, expert on uh, how that's done and, you know, maybe you could talk about uh, Connecticut as a, as a model for other states or, or, or what have you. She's a member of the American Psychiatric Association's Council on Psychiatry and Law and the past president of the Connecticut Psychiatric Society. And then we have my friend, uh, Bill Fisher, Dr. Fisher is a sociologist and criminologist and a, and a distinguished mental health services researcher who uh, trained originally at Northeastern University and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He currently serves as a senior consultant to the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, affectionately known as NASHVID. Uh, Bill had a long and distinguished career as a professor in the psychiatry department at University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he was the founding 
co-director of the NIMH-funded Center for Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice Research. Uh, he uh, received numerous awards and has published widely on topics in mental health policy as it relates to the criminal justice system, including uh, a recent national survey uh, with Nashbit and uh, on these uh, of state mental health authorities' experiences with competence to stand trial, and he can uh, talk to us and bring some data to bear on, on this topic. And finally, we have uh, my friend, Dr. Deb Pinels, Deborah Pinels, who's a dis very distinguished forensic psychiatrist and and a really a forward-thinking national leader on various important issues in mental health law and policy and the legal regulation of psychiatric practice. She is the medical director of behavioral health and forensic services for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She teaches at, at the University of Michigan, both in the law school and the medical school, where she directs the program on psychiatry, law, and ethics. She was uh, formerly the assistant commissioner in charge of forensic services for the Massachusetts Department of mental health and was a colleague of Bill Fisher's there uh, and uh, spent nearly a decade of her career overseeing reentry services for inmates with serious mental illnesses leaving jails and prisons. Dr. Piles is a past president of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law and the current chair of the American Psychiatric Association's Council on Psychiatry and the Law. And again, of special relevance to our topic today, uh, Deb is the co-recipient with, uh, with our colleague Lisa Callahan of the APA's 2021 Manfred S. Gutmacher Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Literature of Forensic Psychiatry awarded this year for a pair of articles on the state of competence to stand trial and competence restoration and notable advances. So uh, you can see we have a wonderful panel and I, I'm so grateful to you for making time to join us and talk about this. And let's get started uh, with you, Larry, and just give us a little bit of a, some background and overview maybe on the, on the uh, legal aspects of of this topic and then we'll go from there. So thanks very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to uh, share uh, some slides. I have just a few slides here. Thanks, Jeff. And, and thanks to the Wilson Center for doing this. Um, I'm going to, can anyone see this? Is it up? I yeah. have no confidence that anything I do in this room is <laughs> accurate. Um, just gonna talk for a few minutes about um, this sort of legal question of competency to stand trial, what it's supposed to be about, uh, how it's supposed to work, uh, and how it may be subject to misuse by some well-intended people who would uh, like to perhaps use it to achieve other ends. Uh, people who don't really maybe understand fully the legal background uh, of the, the issue. It's a legal rule, it has to do, it's, it goes back centuries in Anglo-American law. It's part of the law in most legal systems around the world that we don't try defendants who are incompetent to stand trial, maybe not subject to criminal prosecution punishment uh, if they are incompetent to stand trial. And the reason for that is that, you know, you've got uh, an adversarial system of justice. Uh, my thing is not advancing. Why is this? Here we go. An adversarial system of justice uh, in which you've got a defendant and you've got, a, you know, the, the prosecution on the other side and the defendant has rights has the right uh, in, in uh, US law to uh, an attorney, uh, has the right to testify, to confront witnesses uh, from the other side, has the right to make some decisions about the defense, how the defense is going to proceed. And if the defendant's incapable of exercising those rights in a meaningful way, then the rights are empty rights. Uh, and the, uh, the whole criminal justice process is a mockery of justice. That's the idea here, it's all about a triability. Uh, it would violate the Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, to try a defendant who is incompetent to stand trial. It would violate due process. It would be fundamentally unfair to try a defendant who's incompetent. So fairness is one of the considerations here. Accuracy, making sure we have an accurate outcome. The defendant's capable of participating meaningfully enough that, uh, you know, that information will come out. Uh, we have respect for the autonomy uh, of the defendant, and we're concerned about the dignity of the process. Uh, it's a legal writer many years ago who talked about trying an incompetent defendant as an invective against an insensible object, uh, and that just won't do. The constitutional standard the U.S. Supreme Court has laid out, uh, this is a standard that applies across the country, the defendant must have sufficient present ability to consult with his attorney with a reasonable degree of rational understanding <clears throat> and have a rational as well as a factual understanding of the proceedings. Uh, and the defendant must be able to assist in, uh, in, in his defense or her defense. Uh, so it's really about the defendant's understanding of the proceedings, basic understanding of what uh, you know, he or she's caught up in, ability to consult with their lawyer, work with the, uh, the attorney, and generally assist in the case. Uh, that's what competency is supposed to be about. 
Um, it's again, the same standard uh, in all states because it's constitutionally based. Uh, it's a functional standard. You'll see there's no mention uh, of a mental disorder. Now, some states uh, in their statutory definitions will make reference to uh, all of this derived from a mental disability, but clearly the constitution says otherwise. If for any reason the defendant is incapable of participating meaningfully, the defendant can't be tried. So, uh, you know, mental disorder is not required. And if the defendant has a mental disorder, even if it's a serious mental disorder, that doesn't mean the defendant is incompetent to stand trial. Uh, there's studies that show that up to 25 to 30 percent of people who are actively psychotic are competent to stand trial. Uh, the question is the, the person's present ability to do the things that are necessary to muddle through. Uh, it's not concerned with the defendant's mental condition at the time of the crime, issues around responsibility, the insanity defense. It's not concerned about the defendant's need for treatment, generally. Uh, it's not concerned about the defendant's suitability for diversion or a treatment disposition. All of those are irrelevant to the legal question of triability, whether this defendant can do the things that are necessary to participate in the case. And that's kind of the question, competency to do what? Uh, not much is required in most cases. 90% of cases, 95% in some states, of defendants plead out. They plead guilty to the charge and they don't have to testify. They don't have to really, they don't have a whole lot they have to do uh, in the case. Just have to work with the lawyer, uh, agree with the attorney that this is the way to go, attend court and say, I'm in. Uh, and that's about all that's required. Some cases are more involved. The defendant may uh, you know, need to testify. Some cases may have more serious charges or may be more complicated. More is required of the defendant to be triable uh, in that, in that uh, instance. Uh, but in the typical case, not a whole lot is required of a defendant to be competent to stand trial. Just think about people who go to court, all the people who pass through the criminal justice system who have really no clue what they're caught up in. They're competent to stand trial. We're talking here about someone who has some sort of condition that makes them incapable of, of doing the things they need to do to, to participate in the case. As a practical matter, most defendants who are incompetent are incompetent because of a serious mental disorder. Uh, you know, they have uh, delusions, uh, they have psychosis, uh, uh, they uh, have thought disorder, uh, or they may have intellectual disability. That's sometimes seen as the, the reason a defendant is incompetent. And because so often practically it's driven by a mental disability, when there's an evaluation, when the question's raised, there's a procedure for an evaluation by a mental health professional. But it should be the kind of mental health professional who's been a program like Arena's, uh, who's been trained to do forensic evaluations, to know the issues to look at, uh, to focus the evaluation on the question of triability, and not to look past that, not to look at questions of uh, the person's mental state at the time of the crime not to be looking more globally at the person's need for treatment, but to focus really on the question of their triability. Defendants have you know, the right not to speak with any sort of government authority prior to trial. I mean, you think about you know, the right uh, not to speak, the Miranda rights and all of that when you're being interrogated, and that carries over, particularly uh, if uh, the questions, the inquiry is going to be about the person's mental condition. They have the right uh, not to participate uh, in that conversation unless it's this question you know, which uh, may be necessary to protect their right to a fair trial. So this is an exception in a way to, to the rule that defendants don't have to talk to mental health professionals before a trial. That ordinarily is their choice. Uh, this, this is an exception driven just about concerns about triability. Uh, now, so there's an evaluation uh, as a practical matter in most states, these evaluations typically are done on an outpatient basis. Some courts will order an evaluation inpatient. Some states do some evaluations uh, in, at, in facilities. But you know, most states, uh, the majority of these evaluations are done in the community. But if a person is found to be incompetent, so often the person is going to be admitted to an institution, to a facility for services, treatment, uh, to restore the person's competence uh, to stand trial. Uh, but there are limits on what can be done. Uh, again, driven by the law, the US Supreme Court said, if it appears the defendant's not going to attain competency in the foreseeable future, then you can't proceed with treatment for purposes of restoring competence to stand trial. You can always civilly commit someone or use other legal mechanisms to get treatment to people who may have a treatment need. But if the treatment's for the purposes of restoring competence to stand trial, once it's apparent this person's not going to become competent, there's no justification for treatment. Uh, to restore competence. Involuntary meds, the uh, US Supreme Court a few years ago in the cell case said, involuntary meds are permissible 
to restore a defendant's competence, but only if uh, the government's interest in prosecuting this defendant are important, uh, that uh, the, uh, it's likely that if the person were to go to trial, they would get a substantial sentence. That might justify overriding the defendant's right ordinarily to refuse medications because it's so important we get this case to trial. But if the charges are less serious, that, uh, that legal justification sort of falls away. Services should always be uh, limited to what's necessary to restore competence because that's all that matters here. Uh, now, that's the law. That's what the law says this is about. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, there's all kinds of potential for misuse by uh, well-meaning people, well-meaning actors who would sort of see the opportunity here uh, to get someone uh, who's caught up in the criminal justice system over to treatment. All it takes is for the judge to go, uh, slam the gavel and order an evaluation of competence to stand trial, order the person off to a facility uh, to get services. Uh, but the ABA some years ago looked at this and they were developing standards on criminal justice and mental health, uh, revised more recently uh, and you know, kind of identifying uh, the potential for misuse here and cautioning against uh, misusing this competency construct to, to achieve other ends. Uh, and I've got just a few selected provisions from the standards that the evaluation uh, should never address the person's mental state at the time of the crime or anything else other than competence to stand trial. Uh, the evaluation should never be used to obtain treatment unrelated to competence. Uh, if an evaluator does an evaluation of defendant's competence to stand trial and concludes the defendant is competent, they should say nothing about treatment, uh, the individual's treatment needs. It's irrelevant now. We're just exploring this uh, defendant's competence to stand trial. Uh, and if they're incompetent, you know, maybe what they may need to uh, regain competence to stand trial. But if they're competent, that's irrelevant. Uh, and if the defendant, during the course of the, uh, the evaluation, shares information with the evaluator, it's considered privileged uh, only to be used to address the question of competence to stand trial uh, and related restoration issues. If the person's found to be incompetent, information from that uh, uh, evaluation can be used to sort of inform decisions about treatment to restore competence to stand trial, but for no other reason unless the defendant waives the privilege. So all of this is... is recognized by the ABA. Uh, there is an exception uh, within the ABA standards that this is recently when the uh, standards were uh, sort of revised just a few years ago, sort of a concession to diversion uh, in these cases where defendants are sent for an evaluation of their competence uh, and the evaluation comes back suggesting the defendant is incompetent to stay in trial, but it's really someone who would be a good candidate for treatment, for diversion to treatment. Uh, and here the standards say, well, it ought to be okay in a case like that to drop the charges, dismiss the charges if the prosecution and the defense agree that diverting the case this way would be preferable to uh, going down the road of restoring this defendant to competence and returning the defendant to court. Dismiss the charges, but the defendant must assent. This is a defendant who may not be capable of giving informed consent, but at least they have to agree uh, that this is what they want. And that under these circumstances, it would be okay uh, then to proceed to a diversion treatment for the individual, but it's not treatment to restore competence to stay in trial. It's not the use of you know, competency restoration services to achieve the end of basically engaging someone in a set of services that might result in the person's service down the road in the community and a conversion to, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of the criminal case to, uh, you know, treatment uh, without criminal uh, court involvement. So it, it's important, and I mentioned all this, and I've sort of maybe placed too much of an emphasis on this because I think what's happening around the country right now is uh, there are a lot of people being referred, maybe less because people are concerned about their triability and getting them back to court so they can be uh, you know, tried fairly, but more about uh, using this uh, process to divert uh, individuals from the criminal justice system to the mental health system for treatment. So that's just uh, a note to set things off. Well, thanks very much, Larry. That was a tremendous uh, overview. Just give us the, the legal backstory of competence and trial. So let's turn next to Dr. Kapoor and hear from you, Rena, about your, you know, experience here in Connecticut. I mean, this is your day job, and so um, uh, we're we're eager to hear, uh, you know, what you have to say about this and uh, from your experience in Connecticut or, or other insights that you may have to share with us. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. 
happy to be able to give my perspective as a psychiatrist who's working in competency restoration at the ground level. Um, and I hope to explain why I think that even though there is potential for misuse, as Larry had pointed out, that competency restoration does have a legitimate and an important purpose in the continuum of mental health services that we provide for individuals involved with the criminal justice system. Um, and in particular, why jail diversion isn't always uh, a strategy that we can use as a substitute for competency restoration. So I will acknowledge though that I work in a system that has a lot of luxuries and isn't representative of how things are in most states around the country. Connecticut has a relatively well-resourced mental health system a fairly progressive criminal justice system. We already have services at all intervention points of the sequential intercept model, including a robust jail diversion program. And our competency restoration inpatient program doesn't have any wait lists. You come into the hospital the day that you're found incompetent. We have enough beds, we have meaningful treatment, meaningful discharge planning, and that's not the case everywhere around the country. But even in that setting, like we still do competency restoration. Um, and I'll explain why I think that that's not only necessary, but beneficial in the system. So whenever people talk about um, mentally ill people getting involved with the criminal justice system, you'll hear an example that's like a man with schizophrenia who's yelling on the sidewalk, he gets arrested for breach of peace, um, and then he spends many months either detained in jail or hospitalized at tremendous cost to the state and to the taxpayers. Um, and I'd be the, be the first person to agree that that guy shouldn't be in a competency restoration program, that that's someone who likely could be diverted. But it also doesn't represent the norm of kind of who I see in our restoration program day to day. Because in that example that I just gave of the man who's uh, on the sidewalk and yelling, uh, and gets arrested for breach of peace, there are three important things that are in place. You know, that man has either an established or an obvious uh, mental illness. You know, he's either exhibiting symptoms or he's already known to the system. Um, he is willing to engage in treatment or at least assenting as Lori, Larry had just said. Um, and he's charged with a nonviolent or a less serious offense. Um, and our restoration program serves people where one or more of those three elements is missing. Um, so for example, person doesn't acknowledge their illness or their need for treatment. That's probably the most common thing that keeps people out of jail diversion because it has to be voluntary on the part of the defendant. Um, or they simply wanna keep their mental health treatment private and separate from this very public legal proceeding, which is also a legitimate viewpoint. Sometimes the person has no history of mental illness um, and it doesn't occur until later in the adjudication process that the attorney, their defender realizes, oh, I'm having difficulty working with them. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, and there's a genuine diagnostic question and a workup that needs to be done um, in a hospital. So for example, to figure out whether this person has dementia, whether there's a delusional disorder something like that. Um, or the last uh, thing that keeps people out of diversion is uh, when there are serious charges for a violent offense like murder or sexual assault, where the state has an interest in prosecution and they simply aren't going to agree to uh, diversion as an outcome of that. Um, and those people, those are the ones who I see in our inpatient restoration program. You know, they're elderly people who have committed a homicide and turn out to have dementia. There's sometimes people with lifelong intellectual disabilities. There are often people with psychotic disorders who have been languishing on the street who have no insight um, into their illness or their need for treatment. And you know, through my physician's clinical and ethical lens, I don't feel bad about providing treatment to them even in a hospital setting. You know, others may disagree. 
but when the hospitalization results in evaluation and treatment that the person couldn't have gotten in corrections or sometimes even in an outpatient setting, to me, that is in the best interests of the patient um, and worthy of doing. I'll just mention one other thing um, before I turn things over back to Jeff is that Competency restoration protects not just the dignity of the court proceedings, um, but also the dignity and the rights of the dependent. You know, I don't want us to forget that many, if not most of the people who are involved at this interface of mental health and criminal justice are very vulnerable and they're marginalized people. They're often poor, they're dark skinned, they're undereducated, they have serious mental disabilities. Um, and you know, improving their health and their mental capacities through competency restoration gives them the same chance to fight for justice that hopefully you and I would have. And I think that's really important. I give you a story of uh, a man who in Connecticut kind of was well known to our mental health system and to the police um, for being a person who had schizophrenia and substance use disorders because he'd been arrested and he'd been incarcerated and hospitalized many, many times. And there was an occasion where he got arrested and charged with a sexual assault that had allegedly happened a few months earlier. So by the time he was arrested, he was you know, living on the street, floridly psychotic. Um, they order a competency evaluation. Um, he's found incompetent and gets sent to the hospital for restoration. After getting treatment, he's better um, and he's able to work with his lawyer um, and lo and behold it turns out that he had actually been psychiatrically hospitalized at the time when this alleged sexual assault happened and so he could not have done it um, and you know I just want us to imagine like if he if that man had been diverted and in many ways like he would be the ideal candidate to be diverted um, and he had assented to having um, treatment, uh, maybe even accepting a guilty plea or some kind of probation outcome. You know, to me, that would have been potentially a worse outcome and it would have denied him the chance to prove his innocence and would have given the court kind of the power to now impose things upon him that they had no right to do so. so I'll conclude just by saying that you know, no one is denying that there's huge problems with the competency to stand trial system, the restoration process around the country. I'm sure you're about to hear more of that from our speakers. And I know it can be tempting to scrap this concept altogether, put our resources elsewhere, but I just want us to be careful about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. To me, competency restoration is a necessary part of the continuum of services that we provide. And rather than eliminating it, we want to focus on providing the right treatment for the right people. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Rena, for that very informative presentation and just giving us that perspective and thinking about uh, competency restoration with, within the mental health system. And, and as this, um, um, uh, you know, um, you know, from the clinical perspective, as well as thinking about the person as a, as a defendant. So uh, uh, Bill Fisher, let's move to you and um, give us your, your thoughts and perspective. And, and maybe you could talk about uh, some of the uh, larger systems issue or, or, or some of the, the data that you um, have collected in, in your survey, your work with Nash, with Nashville. So uh, Bill, welcome. Sure, thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, it was my task, I think, to uh, talk a little bit about some systems effect of um, it, competency evaluation uh, referrals on, uh, and I, my focus really has been on the, the effect on state mental health hospitals, state psychiatric hospitals. Uh, keeping in mind that, uh, as, as probably all of you know, not all states use their psychiatric inpatient facilities for competency evaluation. and. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's a little unclear, in fact, we, uh, at working with the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors Research Institute, which I will uh, henceforth call NRI for the, <laughs> for the sake of brevity, uh, we worked, uh, to, in fact, Deb and Larry worked on this as well as consultants, and 
you provided some very valuable input. We looked at the overall use of state mental health agencies for the broad category of what they called forensic patients, which is a broad, very broad category that includes not only people uh, referred for competency to stand trial or restoration of competency, but also people who are uh, transferred um, from correctional facilities to state hospitals in order to get uh, better treatment. Uh, in some states, uh, civilly committed sex offenders who have wrapped up prison sentences but are still considered sexually dangerous and they are civilly committed. So it's really, and also of course, people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. And it's, it's uh, quite a grab bag of categories. Now, for our purposes, uh, we're interested in competency to stand trial. One of the general findings about forensic uh, uh, patients in psychiatric hospitals is that the, their numbers of, in, in those states that use their psychiatric facilities for this purpose, they, uh, the numbers of forensic patients are, are uh, increasing, but that increase is driven largely by people who have been found, uh, who are undergoing competency evaluations or have been referred for restoration purposes. Uh, I knew that somebody would ask the question or I'll ask the question and then I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, we looked at, in the NRI uh, project, uh, we looked at, uh, at, we did two things. Actually, we did three things. The first two were, were data issues. One was we conducted a survey of state mental health forensic directors. And I don't know if, if Rena uh, was in Connecticut and was one of the respondents, this was so maybe two or three years ago, uh, but people in Rena's role or in Deb Heindel's role were the, were, the, were the respondents. And they were kind enough in most states to fill out this rather lengthy questionnaire. And in addition to that, we used data that, that, that uh, NRI collects routinely in their state the mental health profiling system. So uh, we had 37 states that reported data on this. And... Uh, um, some states, and keep in mind that the numbers in some of these states are small, so that if you go from one admission to two admissions, you have a 100% increase. <laughs> and so we have to view these numbers with some caution. But um, Arizona, uh, between 2005 and 2014, had a 2,500% increase in the number of competency uh, um, admissions. Minnesota had 517%. Uh, so in, in 2016, um, excuse me for looking at my notes here, but in 2016, seven states combined had admission rates of about 15 per 100,000 uh, adult civilian population. That included people um, with, um, that included um, all states that had reported more than zero uh, uh, admissions for competency evaluation. So our findings relative to, to forensic admissions kind of looked like this. Um, there's been a rise in them. Uh, nationally, um, there's a, um, there has been an increase in the increase, if you will. Between 1999 and uh, 2005, there was a 45%, uh, 46% increase. And between uh, 2005 and 2016, there was an 84% increase among the states that, 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 again, among just among the states that do this kind of thing. And uh, it's unclear why. Uh, and uh, to sort of fill out this picture, we also did interviews with judges. We interviewed judges, about 20 judges from around the country and asked them these questions about, you know, why do they think the numbers of people are, uh, that they're referring for competency evaluations have gone up in their state? And we looked at, at states where that had been the case. 
And for one thing, they, some judges said, well, we're seeing more persons with serious mental illness in our courts. And I think this is kind of interesting considering that this was done in, in the, uh, the late 20 teens, if you will, when supposedly jail diversion programs were just proliferating all around the country. And yet these judges said uh, that they didn't think the jail diversion programs worked very well and that they saw, they were still seeing more and more people with serious mental illnesses in their courts. And some of them said, well, you know, I don't um, like the idea of sending these folks to jail because I know that uh, there's such a hue and cry about the presence of people with serious mental illness, uh, illnesses in, in uh, local jails, and I don't want to contribute to that. So of course, <laughs> why not send the person to a psychiatric hospital for a competency evaluation, which of course the judge is perfectly reason, uh, perfectly entitled to do. Um, another uh, cited, uh, another group cited lack of alternative dispositions or lack of knowledge of alternative dispositions in their communities where they could refer people, uh, or you know they could order them to to uh, go and receive services. And that some of these were adequate, in other cases, they were inadequately funded, they, there were long waiting times, and this was, uh, this was as, as Larry Fitch noted, all you have to do is bang the gavel, and the person is ordered for a competency evaluation. Now, as I look at this body of responses, and despite the fact, that, and this kind of flies in the face of Larry's point about the ABA's position, that it, that we don't use competency evaluations to um, uh, obtain treatment for people with mental illness. Competency evaluations are for evaluating competency. But uh, it looks to me, if I were a health economist, I would say that judges are viewing, uh, especially the inpatient, uh, well, definitely the inpatient referrals, Judges are viewing these what, uh, from the standpoint of what a health economist would view as a free good. It's there, you can take it anytime. And um, this has um, some dramatic systemic effects. And I am going to talk a little bit about, uh, I am currently sitting uh, just outside of Worcester, Massachusetts, a, a, an area that uh, Deb Heinels knows well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my home state, if that's okay, because I, I can provide a little bit more of a granular perspective on what some of these um, uh, systems effects are. Um, state mental health agencies, facilities in many states are obligated to accept whoever the court sends them. Uh, and in some cases, it appears that judges are, uh, are using this quite um, quite generously, uh, and they're generous. Some states have uh, wait lists on their forensic units. Uh, Massachusetts does not at the moment. However, I will. I have. I have inside information here because, um, in the interest of full disclosure, I have a daughter who was a psychiatric social worker working on the forensic unit. It was what used to be Worcester State Hospital. So I get all sorts of inside scoop. Well, she was working on the forensic unit and then also was assigned to something called the forensic overflow unit, which I think tells us something about uh, the, the, the pace of admissions there. Uh, this has um, consequences down the road uh, or down the system. So in Massachusetts, for example, we have a system whereby people are not uh, directly committed, for the most part, directly committed to our state psychiatric hospitals. However, uh, it's so we have uh, state hospitals are used for what we call continuing treatment. Typically, they are people who have been in ge local general hospitals. They've done their 30-day stint. Um, they still need continuing treatment, but the, the general hospitals are not going to take up a bed to continue to hold this person. And so they try to refer them to the state hospital. But sadly though, the state hospital is running out of beds, partly because we've closed too many beds, but also because in addition to the 
forensic patients that are there. There is a group of people, and I don't quite know what to call them. They're sort of quasi-forensic. They're people who've been to court and either been, uh, they had their cases dismissed or whatever, and they have been civilly committed back to the state hospital. They're not currently forensic patients. They may not be on the forensic unit, but nonetheless, um, there is an increasing percentage of people in that facility that either entered our forensic patients or entered as forensic patients. And uh, the problem with that is that these people take up beds in some cases for a very long time, meaning that these transfers for continuing treatment have long wait lists. That means that they are backed up in, in local general hospitals, uh, medic they, that they're taking up a bed. The hospital cannot bill Medicaid, let's say, for a uh, full treatment day. Because they are on what's called administrative, at an administrative rate. They're not getting more than just very basic treatments. And this, in turn, backs up the hospital system generally, and this is creating this the psychiatric boarding problem that many uh, states report because they can't find general hospital beds because the general hospital beds are filled they, because they can't get into continuing treatment units. So I, I'm left with a number of, of questions. I, I'm wondering, for example, where does the uh, kind of the rubber meet the road here? We, do we need to um, provide better education for judges? Um, and, and I would leave that question, I guess, to, to Larry. Uh, is, is this a legal education question? Is it, uh, what are the factors <clears throat> that dictate whether um, some judges and some courts use this more um, commonly than others? Uh, I don't know. I, obviously, as, as many uh, published papers will state at their conclusion, uh, more research is needed. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, the numbers are really, really fascinating. The fact is that the states, and I don't want to use uh, Jeff and Paul Applebaum's um, statement, but I, I, well, I will anyway. The states are all over the map in terms of, of that's uh, Paul Applebaum's line. And, Jeff's use it uh, liberally, and I will too. States are all over the map with respect to their uh, how they manage this. And if I if I did show you a graph, it would a, a bar graph of states where uh, the, these factors are are in play. You would see uh, states with huge increases over time, and also you would see a number of states with significant decreases. And so what's happening in the states where there are decreases compared to the states where there are big increases? Is it a criminal justice problem? Is it a court problem? Is it a mental health problem? And I, like I said, more research is, is needed. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. That was, uh, again, really terrific uh, from a kind of different uh, level of, of resolution on this, on this problem. Um, uh, Deb, let's turn to you. You're kind of our cleanup batter here now. You kind of loaded <laughs> the bases and and, um, and and all kinds of questions that I have, uh, but you 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 bring to this uh, so much, both in terms of your your clinical work and your policy work, and you've you've taught uh, judges and you've taught uh, psychiatrists and everybody in between, and, and, and thought about these things uh, for a long time, and you've just heard these perspectives. So, uh, tell us what you think, Kevin. Yeah, Deb loves sports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a super interesting. Um, it's, it's very interesting to be the one that goes last to hear all these different perspectives. And, you know, I'm sort of thinking about the audience and the participants who may have a range of their own experiences, may know nothing about this system and what's going on, or may be heavily involved, whether it's as a, as a, you know, working in defense or prosecution or even judges that might be participating or, or clinicians wondering what they do when patients come their way. And, you know, I think there's different answers to the questions when you're working on the ground on a case by case basis versus when you're looking at things from a taxpayer, fiscal, spending and humanitarian perspective of what are we trying to do here? And the story that I tell that kind of got me into this um, was uh, when I was working in Massachusetts and I took on a case 
of, a, of an individual who was committed to the state hospital. In Massachusetts, there's no restoration statute, there's, but people do get committed for evaluations. And there are screening clinicians that don't exist in other parts of the country who determine and help the judges determine, even though sometimes the judges do override that. But for the most part, there's more clinical input in Massachusetts than there are in other parts of the country of who should come into the hospital. Um, but nevertheless, a woman came in for evaluation. Um, her competency evaluation um, was sought after by her attorney. She had a very complicated history, major trauma from an early age. She was you know, locked in a closet and sexually molested at very critical developmental stages. She ultimately ended up becoming um, someone with an opioid use disorder. Uh, pro probably certainly post-traumatic stress disorder and had learned to adapt in life through maladaptive, what we would consider maladaptive mechanisms, which means that when she got to court, she was acting aberrantly and her attorney rightly raised the question of her competence to stand trial. And because it couldn't be sorted out at the court clinic level, she got sent to the state hospital where we spent a lot of time. I had fellows in training working with me. Uh, we did very sophisticated psychological testing. She continued to act aberrantly from the unit norms. So people didn't know what was going on. She reported hearing voices. She was irritable. She engaged in some self-injury and it became very difficult to know whether she was actually competent or not competent to work with her lawyer around these charges. After a very complex period of evaluation and examination, we rendered, I rendered an opinion that she was competent to stand trial and that she was malingering, faking symptoms. She went back to court. Well, on a random, in a random series of events, um, the next day, I didn't think twice of it. The next, you know, we came up with a disposition plan in Massachusetts, you have to come up with a treatment plan and recommendations. The next day I was going uh, with uh, one of our state leaders to a mental health court to go visit the mental health court program. And it turned out it was in the same court where this woman's charges were. And lo and behold, on the docket for that day, this woman's name appeared and uh, for a totally different case. And she didn't show up. And I sat there sort of wondering what we had just spent 20 days doing. I didn't know whether she was dead. I didn't know whether she was absconding. I didn't know whether she was rearrested. Um, Really nothing, I still don't know to this day what happened to that woman, but she didn't show up. I know they had issued another bench warrant to try and bring her back into this mental health court. Um, but, it, but it really is a case that I highlight because it gets, got me thinking about what are we doing here at a larger level? Do I think I did an excellent job on that competency evaluation and helped inform the judge in the way that I think was ethically the most responsible thing to do? because I was acting under a court order? Absolutely, I'm very proud of the work that we did. Do I think from a systems perspective, the use of that hospitalization um, or that whole process help, helped either in that particular case or in future cases or from a larger level for this woman or society who she had potentially menaced in the charges that she was facing where they did involve some threats to the public. So do I think we did well for society? Not really, I don't, I don't know if we did well for society. So I would totally agree with Rena. I am a, a believer in restoration services for the right reason and for the right people at the right time. But I think that very often the systems as I've seen in, in, in across the states that I've worked in are utilizing the competency system to access something that they think they're getting that they may not be getting at the end of the day. Um, and so now I've traveled and I've worked across too, too many, I'm the wandering forensic psychiatrist and the wandering state leader, too many states to count um, in terms of how many that I've, I've touched. Um, and you see a lot of issues where you see people revolving through the competency system despite the best of intentions. Um, we're just not doing enough around prevention of people with, with mental illness, intellectual and developmental disabilities and substance use disorders from getting into the competency system in the first place. And then also not doing enough to um, think about how they can be linked to proper services when they leave. Connecticut may be a model. Um, there may be other challenges that aren't possible to replicate. 
it's hard to compare states sometimes because there's so many things that go into how states are structured. Um, and so I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've been working on, and I'll do just a little screen share also, uh, if I can, um, is we've been really working on this notion of, of the, through the sequential intercept model, which is a model that really wasn't geared for people in the competency system, but it was, it was developed with this community mental health lens of saying, you know, we need, we have too many people with mental, it started with saying we have too many people with mental illness in the criminal legal system, and we need to find ways to divert them out when that's appropriate and safe for public safety. And it started with intercept one, the law enforcement touch point, and then moved to that initial detention and court hearings to jails and courts, reentry, and then community supervision. And then in 2017, Intercept Zero was attached to, to the framework to look at what can we build for community services that will avoid that law enforcement contact altogether. And certainly nowadays, as people are talking about defund police, everybody's talking about the crisis system and how to build out the crisis system. Um, I would say, you know, even Connecticut and other states, every state, everybody's looking at this crisis system and how we're gonna, how it's gonna look. And so one of the things that my colleague, Lisa Callahan and I did, which we got that Guttmacher Award for, was really talk about, can we look at strategies, knowing that some people do need to go into the system for restoration, um, but can we look at strategies that better support individuals and not compromise their due process rights, also not compromise their Americans with Disabilities Act, Olmstead rights, um, and, that, and, and balance their, their rights with society's right to be protected and to have fair and accurate trial processes. Um, and so what we've looked at is how does the sequential intercept model map onto the competency system or vice versa, really at that intercept two and three framework and sort of saying when competency is raised, like the American Bar Association has said, is competency really the necessary question? Is it a low level offense that could be diverted where you're not gonna spend a lot of resources pursuing competency when trial is not gonna be something that's gonna ever come up? So why does the defendant need to be competent to stand trial? Or even a, a plea bargain may never even come up because nobody's really interested in pursuing these charges to begin with. Then with the evaluation period, are the evaluators connected to the treatment system to be able to make least restrictive alternative recommendations or are statutes even constructed to allow for an individual to be sent for further treatment in a lesser restrictive environment. You know, the competency system was built on an inpatient system, a state hospital system. And so what states are trying to do now is say, hey, it's not just diversion from jail, it's diversion from the state hospital. If that person doesn't need a state hospital, to get their treatment needs met. If they need the state hospital, then that's great. But is the state hospital really the best place for somebody with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Is it really the best place for somebody with a neurocognitive condition? We're working with the American Bar Association right now on the Commission on Law and Aging to say people with neurocognitive conditions, dementias, often are, are, are sent into this restoration system. Well, they're not gonna get restored, but, but is that really the right place? And if the state hospital is the only place for the high the offender with a very serious charge to go, then we better do a lot for those state hospitals to revamp their programs because they're not informed about things in general about how to manage people with intellectual and developmental disabilities or people with, you know, dementias. And so uh, without going further, uh, because I know that you want time for questions, I'll just stop there to say, we need to really be thinking in a much more nuanced manner and not treat every person who comes into the court, you know, it's not every, what is the phrase, you know, if, you, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, you, you, we really have to be more nuanced in our approaches so that actually we can reserve those, hosp those precious resource hospital beds, um, which are already stretched and understaffed to the, in every, pretty much in every state. Um, use those resources for the people who really need them, whether they're in the forensic system or not in the forensic system, and then build out resources along a continuum of care, whether somebody has criminal charges or not, and use jails for those who need them, and you know, really build up community systems 
um, for everyone who doesn't need walls around them from a public safety or treatment perspective. And so I'll just stop there and leave uh, that uh, open for further dialogue and conversation. Thank you, Deb, another wonderful presentation. You know, I wanna give a chance for any of the panelists to respond to things others have said. As I was listening to this, I, you know, I wrote down uh, just a phrase that, that each of you used and I'm looking at them now and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, are these phrases all talking about the same thing? Uh, and how, how can we maybe, you know, bring, bring them together? Um, so, you know, during um, um, Larry's presentation, um, you know, I wrote down the phrase due process for the uh, criminal defendant. And in Arena's presentation, I wrote down the phrase best interest of the patient. Um, so we have a patient and we have a defendant. And, um, and in uh, Bill's presentation, I wrote down the, the phrase uh, free, free good for the judge. Uh, so now we have uh, the, the, the judge. And, um, and in uh, Deborah's presentation, I wrote down the phrase doing what is good for society. So we have society, we have the judge as a legal actor, we have um, a, a person referred to as a, as a defendant with due process, and we have the patient who is uh, someone who has uh, a need for treatment and care. Um, so uh, just as kind of grist for the mill, um, but let me just maybe circle back to you, Larry. And, and as I think about these different phrases, um, um, are there some incompatibilities about, uh, or some, some, maybe some, you know, contradictions in how we're thinking about this? Uh, or do you have anything to... Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, and I have a sort of a legal take on this particular issue that I've articulated. But I've also overseen a, a forensic mental health system. I've worked within mental health services for years. I was actually the CEO of a forensic maximum security hospital for a year. So I have sort of that perspective as well. And I understand the systems uh, issues here are big. Um, but it's important to recognize when it comes down to the defendant, the individual who's involved in this case, this is supposed to be about protecting that individual's rights. That's, that's the reason this question uh, arises. It's the reason the ABA was so concerned about how it could be used to address other issues. Well, there are other ways you can get at those other issues. Sort of in, in defense of the ABA's take on you know, uh, you know, cautioning against misusing competency this way, the ABA has two chapters on educating judges about other approaches to dealing with people who are mentally ill, diversion, mental health courts, all the rest. Um, it recognizes the problem of people who have mental uh, disorders and who bounce around systems in and out cycle between criminal justice, mental health, uh, and the importance of sort of intercepting them along the way and, and, and getting them connected with the services that are appropriate voluntarily. Uh, through or some other process. Here, we're, we're talking about a process for involuntarily uh, diverting people who, for that matter, may not even have committed the offense. As, as, as Rena pointed out, or one of you pointed out a case or someone who uh, was sort of falsely charged. Uh, it was only because they became competent and, and were able to demonstrate their innocence uh, at the trial. So more often, I think, in these cases, the person uh, is committed, is incompetent, uh, and as I think Bill pointed out, uh, converted to some sort of civil patient status that's still kind of forensic, and so they don't cycle to and through in seven to 10 days like almost everyone else who's civilly hospitalized. Uh, because of their involvement in the criminal justice system, the fact that they came into the mental health system that way, they're treated differently, uh, and they're there for a long time, or maybe they're diverted but with an understanding that their participation, their adherence to services uh, is part of you know, the disposition. Suddenly now, uh, you know, they never had a trial, but their case has been disposed of as though they were found guilty uh, and had a mental health need that need to be the focus of disposition. Uh, and if you look at it from you know, the perspective of a lawyer, that's a violation of due process. Uh, that's that's a fundamentally unfair because it wasn't the person who was driving that outcome. At the same time, the system recognizes that, you know, that there are system failures. And now we've got an opportunity here uh, to engage the person, uh, get them the services they really need. I mean, I think forensic patients are the ones who get priority for the best quality services that, that we have to offer. Uh, and, I, and getting at something I think Deborah said, or maybe it was, it was Bill, 
uh, it often displaces people whose clinical need may be even greater, particularly the population of people with intellectual disabilities. Most states have long waiting lists of people who have a need for services. You know, uh, families that are aging out and they've always taken care of their child and now they're going into assisted living and this child needs services and is placed on this long waiting list for services. They never get there though because the court is taking people whose level of, of need is much less and is placing them in all the spots. All, all the slots get taken up because they have found their way into the system by way of the criminal justice system. So there are big systems issues here uh, to deal with. And, and you know, we have an obligation to do better uh, when people engage these two systems and the encounter the criminal justice system to try to, if, if they're appropriate for a mental health disposition, get them over there, but do it in a way that respects uh, their rights, uh, I think. Thank you, Larry. Um, are, there, are there other comments from the panelists uh, on you know, what uh, each of you said? I wonder, for example, if um, others have an idea, what, what would be the answer to Bill's question about the increase in the numbers of people who are referred for competency? Is this, um, you know, is this a symptom of um, some you know, larger issues and you know, fissures in the, in the public behavioral health system? or in the legal system? Um, are, there, are there reasons for it? Um, and uh, what might be the implications? There's many theories as to why there's an increase in these referrals, but I think states are very consistently showing increased demand for competency services. One theory is that there's something going on in the community that despite everybody's effort at diversion and working on you know, getting people out of the criminal justice system, people are still coming in. Others say we've done such a good job educating judges and lawyers about competency that people are raising the issue more and, and rightly so because you don't want a person with mental illness to be tried and you know be missing through the cracks. I don't think we have quite the answers on why we're seeing more. I can tell you in Michigan, we're seeing more misde misdemeanors being ordered in and more. And when we look at our data, and this is I think true in other states, of those that are referred for competency, more of the misdemeanors are found by the clinician to be recommended to be found incompetent, which means basically they're sicker uh, with their illnesses. And so that's something that I think we are trying to look at across systems. You know, I, I recall uh, uh, being at a lecture given by our, our friend and colleague, Henry Stedman, who um, adamantly said um, uh, competency, uh, uh, um, competency uh, evaluations are not a form of jail diversion. Um, and yet, <laughs> I, would, I would always be afraid to take issue with, with him, but, but I think in, <laughs> in this case, I'm inclined to disagree. Well, well, I think it used to be. I think it used to be, but now there's backlog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's well, interesting. I mean, I think the, the, the larger problem is that people are cycling in and out, and the services that we have in place, even through, you know, well-intentioned diversion programs, uh, are not sufficiently comprehensive, you know, that it's so much more than just mental health care that people need to make it in the community. They need housing. Uh, they need other supports, uh, and that stuff's in short supply. Uh, and, uh, you know, probably the worst uh, mechanism for getting them connected with what they really need is competency to stand trial, because that's supposed to be just about getting them back to court for trial. Uh, you know, we just need to put more of our resources into the more comprehensive community uh, services that would enable people to make it without being in any of these institutions. I mean, we're talking about long links of stay for people uh, because they came in by way of the criminal justice system, had they come in civilly, that had been in seven to 10 days on average, uh, the average you know, sort of civil commitment. These are lengthy hospitalizations. Uh, and then when we release them, you know, so often it's without the supports they really need to make it when they're released back to the community. Seems to me one of the challenges is you have two kinds of heterogeneity in this population. One is heterogeneity in terms of people's um, history of criminal offending, the kinds of offenses that they're accused of, are they, do they involve violence or not? Are they very serious? Are they less serious? And then you have heterogeneity with respect to people's uh, 
the etiology of their incompetence, the, um, the, the psychiatric condition, whether it's um, you know, dementia or maybe intellectual disability, whatever. And then you're trying to have a policy that's going to work for this population, but maybe you need some different solutions based on uh, these different populations in terms of different pathways into the community and, and the divertibility and so on. Um, and um, yeah, but it's very, but it's, but it's also challenging to think about the fact that this is one part of these much larger systems. So you have pressures on, on both systems um, and um, you know, over time. So let me, uh, let's, let's turn to some of the questions to see if we have any questions in the chat here. Um, and I think we have at least one, uh, two here. So um, let's see. So one person is asking, this is uh, uh, Barbara, is that so to everyone, are there, are there legal mandates about how long a competency evaluation takes place? For example, 30 days versus years. And does this vary by local uh, jail or state uh, federal system? And is there oversight on protection of a person's right to a timely assessment if that exists? Does, does anyone want to answer that question? Well, I'll say it varies by state in terms of, you know, some states have statutes on how soon the uh, report needs to be back once the court has issued the order for the evaluation. But to the more interesting question in a way is how long it takes to get the person to the evaluator. Uh, and, you know, there have been um, lawsuits and, you know, kind of consent decrees where states have been slow to get someone typically to get them into the hospital where you know, it becomes transparent that, you know, what they're really, it's not so much the concerned about I would argue, uh, getting the triability issue resolved, but getting the person off to the hospital for treatment and languishing in jail while they wait for the bed to open up. So, you know, the, the uh, True Blood case out of Washington State and, and other court decisions where people have sued to enforce, uh, you know, a more rapid response to the problem of this person who is in the criminal justice system and has mental illness. But, you know, directly to the question here, yeah, some states it's 30 days. Uh, once the order is cut, the order, the evaluation has to be back. Um, and you can usually get a continuance. And what some states do is they, instead of responding with an opinion that someone's incompetent to stand trial within the 30 day period, they'll ask for a continuance to get the person treatment while they're there for their evaluation. So that when they report back, they've regained their competence and they don't have to deal with an order committing the individual as incompetent, which drags it out even longer. So all kinds of games are played here. I would just add to that that there's also great variability among states um, uh, for how long you have to restore someone to competence, um, like how long you can keep them in the hospital for that purpose. So, you know, in Connecticut, it's 18 months or um, the maximum sentence you could have received for that crime, uh, whichever one is less. In next door Rhode Island, you can keep someone hospitalized for up to two thirds of the maximum sentence for the crime. So if someone has a murder that has a 60 year maximum, you can try and restore them for 40 years uh, as opposed to 18 months in Connecticut. So it's, it matters where you got arrested for the same crime too. But at the same time, the Supreme Court has ruled that if at any point during that you know, number of years it becomes apparent that the person's not going to regain competence in the foreseeable future, they have to be released. Uh, and people just don't take that very seriously. We have another question that um, goes to sort of the distinction between two different, two different kinds of uh, uh, determinations or, or uh, mental health related adjudications. And one has to do with competence and the other is um, uh, culpability. So we think people who might be found um, not guilty by reason of insanity. And the question is, when the crime was committed, what was their status at that time? And um, so these are two separate things. Um, Larry, would, would you like to, and I think we do have, a, a Deborah has uh, uh, clarified this a little bit. Is there an overlap between these two kinds of legal concepts? Is there an overlap in, the, in people who are um, either you know raise this competence as an issue and then later may raise uh, you know uh, insanity as a as a defense and yeah, uh, how do these things together? In many cases, defendants who um, who raise the insanity defense are defendants who uh, were initially uh, referred for an evaluation of their competence and they have regained competence. Now you have to be competent to be insane. 
uh, you know, is, is kind of how you, you might look at this. So, so often, yeah, a person starts as incompetent, gets restored, now raises the insanity defense. Very different question though. And the defendant gets to choose this one. Uh, it can't be imposed uh, on, on the defendant. And the defendant has all kinds of reasons why they may opt not to go down this road, even if they have a viable insanity defense, because the consequences of being found not guilty by reason of insanity can be pretty onerous, uh, sometimes longer confined than if the person had simply pled out. Uh, but yeah, the same population, these issues come up for both. Uh, and then of course, ultimately you come around to what happens when the person is released from any kind of confinement. And you know, the challenge is to make the connection with service providers, uh, either as a condition of probation or a conditional release if the person has been committed uh, as, as not uh, criminally responsible, not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, those are different um, stages of the process though, uh, and usually they're driven more by what the defendant is uh, agreeing to. Uh, the defendant has no say on, on matters relating to their competence. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I was just re remembering a, a research project that our group did some years ago in Connecticut where we um, matched the records of adults with serious mental illnesses in the uh, Department of uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services to uh, records in the criminal justice system, records of arrest and incarceration and all manners of you know, touching the system. And we uh, did a cost study looking at all of these different kinds of events and calculated the total cost in both of these systems for treatment and for uh, people you know, being in these institutions. And, and one, of the, one of the surprising findings that there is that there was a fairly small group of individuals who accounted for a disproportionate cost. And those were people who were in this category we're talking about, who'd been referred to and found incompetent and then were either spending long periods of time in a forensic hospital awaiting restoration or something. And um, it was, it was uh, interesting because if you, if you were to see that cost as something borne by the mental health system, uh, that really increases the cost there. If you were to see these people, or these uh, uh, adults as, as sort of within the uh, purview of the criminal system, and then you know it would make a big difference. And they're sort of in this in-between status. Um, but it was a small group of people, you know. So, you know, thinking about it from all these different ways, um, I, I'd like to just go around and maybe everybody could say, you know, just distilling from this conversation, um, you know, if if there is a problem with the competency system or the competency restoration system. Um, if you could, you know, say number one and number two thing to, to, to do about it, um, you know, do, is, is it an education problem that people need to be um, provided a better orientation to this? And is it a problem of capacity, system capacity? Do we need more, more beds or is it a community care uh, problem? Um, or maybe it's all those things. But, uh, you know, by way of saying this is the problem, what this is what should be done if we could Institute of Reform, um, yeah, let, let, why don't we do that? And then, and then we'll see if there's anything else in the chat and then we can wind up this wonderful discussion. So um, I don't know who wants to start. Um, Deb, maybe we could start with you or um, anybody could jump in. <laughs> sort of the lightning round here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, um, I think there's, I think there's so many things that we can touch on to help address some of these issues. Um, it's, it's, you know, where, where my work has centered has really been at that systems level of legislative reform strategies and program development to get people more knowledgeable about working with criminal legal involved patients and understand where these systems intersect. Um, we do have just a ton more work to do. When I think about these things, the funding silos that, that exist in the public behavioral health system contribute to some of the challenges that we see as well. Um, you know, uh, what Larry was saying before about people not having adequate supports when they leave. Um, you know, housing is modified by different factors than mental health treatment. And so how do you bring those things together? So I'll, I'll just say that. Rena, I was in impressed by how positive you were in your remarks about Connecticut, which is the system where we did this uh, study some years ago. Um, 
So to the extent that you think things are going well in Connecticut, do you think that has to do with the way services are organized and financed? Is it, a, is it really more to do with, um, you know, just more resources in the system? Um, and um, and if, there, if there is room for, for improvement or things you'd think other states should copy about Connecticut, what would you, what would you say about that? Well, I think we're all going to kind of say the same thing, which is that we need to put some resources into the community, you know, because if you don't have a place to divert people to, um, then you're never going to kind of fix the competency system. Yeah. But I also think it's important to realize that those services in the community have to be more than just medication and therapy appointments, you know, like everyone has alluded to. You, people need housing, uh, people need substance abuse supports, people need employment, um, all those things. Um, and those things, even in Connecticut, are still kind of underfunded and under-resourced. Um, I guess I'd also just say one thing that hasn't come up um, is that I also think people need to have a little bit of nuance when thinking about recidivism, um, even amongst the mentally ill population you know, that um, just providing someone treatment isn't gonna be uh, a panacea. You know, people still get, people with mental illness get arrested for a lot of different reasons. And I think um, sometimes that gets lost in this conversation as if just providing mental health treatment is going to uh, stop that revolving door that you rightly pointed out um, accounts for a huge chunk of the costs. And one thing I would sort of say something, addressing something Rena mentioned earlier, the idea that, you know, uh, competency restoration is important uh, and, and absolutely it is. And it's not going anywhere because the, you know, the law requires that if someone's incompetent to stand trial and it allows for this person to be referred then for these services. And where charges are serious and the case is going to go forward, we have to protect the defendant's right uh, to be competent uh, and to get the services they may need, or if the person has an intellectual disability. I saw an article recently about viewing it as an ADA accommodation, accommodating this person's disability by providing the supports to the defense team to enable the case to move forward. So all of that is, uh, is important. And that, I would argue, is sort of to the side of the larger problem that we're dealing with is, you know, which is more how we configure the services systems uh, to you know, provide adequate support for people so they don't revolve in and out. Uh, and, and the point you just made, Rena, I think is maybe the most important point of all, and I think it's lost on lots of, of, of folks in the legal system, is that this is not just about compliance with mental health treatment. This is, uh, I mean, it's not the symptoms of a mental disorder very often that uh, drive the person's criminal behavior. Uh, it's all the other stuff that uh, all, all the other needs they have, something to be doing in the middle of the day and a place to live. Uh, and getting all that in place is expensive, but nothing is more expensive than four or $500 a day in a state hospital getting restored to competency for a trial, for a charge that's bogus. Thank you. Bill, any final remarks from you? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm looking at the research perspective, and I have to say that I, I'm really impressed with the heterogeneity in the states with respect, across states with respect to states that have seen huge increases in their in the use of competency evaluations, and states that have seen some fairly significant declines. And I'd like to know what the states that have undergone declines uh, have done, if, if anything, to, to limit their use of competency uh, evaluation uh, in patient use, in patient services. Um, and I think um, that's really it. I think that every, the points that everyone is making, you know, cry out for uh, research, good, good research that I think uh, uh, someone, someone should fund. I think they're really very, some very important questions, both at the individual level, at the system level, at the state level. Um, so I guess I would leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. I, I think from what we, the research that we do have that we can um, learn from, you know, when we look at the, at the behavior that, um, 
you know, that, that the systems are responding to, um, let's say it's a violent crime and the person does have a mental illness, you know, what we know is that, um, you know, violent behavior is a multi-determined complex uh, behavior that, um, that is caused by many things that uh, many factors that uh, interact with each other and mental illness, the attributable risk there is, is relatively small. And yet, if we have a system set up that that's the, you know, the primary lens through which we're going to see it. And we have also, this resonates with what uh, society thinks that you, if you have a person with mental illness who commits crime, well, then that's got to be about, um, you know, uh, mental illness. Um, it's, it's a challenge to um, push back about that and, re and really think of it more broadly. Um, but this, I, I feel... Um, an awful lot smarter about this topic than I was about an hour ago. And I want to thank you all very much for a, a fascinating set of presentations and conversation about this. And um, thank you all uh, in the audience for, um, for attending. And, and thanks to, to the Wilson Center for Science and Justice for sponsoring this event. This uh, will be available as a recording for anyone um, to watch and um, any, if anybody has any final thoughts, otherwise I would uh, thank you all very much and we can, we can, we can end. Thanks thank you, much. Jeff, for organizing thank this. Thank you so much. Nice seeing all of you. Good to see you all too. Good to see you all. See you.